have uh, Jisoo McDuff, who's going to talk about the sta stabilized symplectic embedding problem. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and talking in honor of Simon Bursty. Um, I'm talking about symplectic geometry, which is certainly a subject he's made wonderful contributions to, but not particularly in the area I'm going to talk about. This is what I think of as light relief, certainly after Dietmar's talk, which was very heavy on formulas and, and analysis. And I'm going to be talking more about sort of geometry and simpler things, I think. Um, so the basic question, the symplectic embedding question, is you have some manifold U, um, symplectic manifold, typically an open manifold. And the question is, you ask, when is there a symplectic embedding um, of this manifold into some other symplectic manifold of the same dimension? And um, there's a lot that we, a huge amount that we don't know about this, this question, actually. Um, but I'm going to try and explain to you a few things that we do know. Now, the whole subject really started with Gromov's um, non-squeezing theorem, which you almost surely know about, which says that looked at the, the question of taking the, the domain here is a ball of size A. So that means the radius is such that pi r squared is A. So that's the area of a, of a two-dimensional slice in this ball. And you're asking when it embeds into a very other, a very simple shape. The shape that he looked at sort of was, was a, a two-dimensional ball times um, Euclidean space. And of course, you just give the standard symplectic form on, the, on these. So omega 0 is just dx1 wedge dy1 plus up to dxn wedge dyn. And you assume that this is in the x1, y1 coordinates, and these are the other coordinates. Um, so this is a symplectic splitting there. And then, you know, Gromov was actually interested in figuring out the difference between symplectic embeddings and volume-preserving embeddings, because this was in 1985, and really rather little was known about symplectic geometry at the time. And what he showed was that there is an, a symplectic embedding, there exists this embedding, if and only if um, the size of the ball is less than the, is smaller than the size of the disk. So you can really only, the only, the best way to put this in is just to translate it there. You can't squeeze it in these two directions. So that's why it's called the non-squeezing theorem. And of course, this theorem is an absolutely fundamental theorem in symplectic geometry. Um, you, any diffeomorphism which has this property that it doesn't squeeze a, b a ball into, you know, into sort of local, uh, lo local balls into local cylinders. Any diffeomorphism with that property preserves a symplectic form up to sign. So it's an absolutely characteristic um, property of symplectic morphisms. And once he, um, I mean, he proved this theorem and then he proved another theorem about embedding two balls. If you have, if you have, um, a big ball, uh, say, of size A, and then you have two balls of the same, both of size little a, and then you ask, when do these balls embed in there? He found an obstruction for that also, which was that, in fact, this, this exists. So you want to embed them disjointly. You want to fit them both in. And they fit in. Uh, you have to have 2a less than or equal to a. So again, you can basically you can't squeeze them in any way. So these were um, rather amazing results. And I want to give you just a little bit of an idea of the proof, because this is the idea of the proof is what carries on how you, how you generalize this to other shapes. So um, what, I mean, Gromov was the one in this paper who introduced the idea of a, a, a J holomorphic curve. So you take a J, which is tame, so that means that omega v of jv is always positive. And so this is sort of positively related to omega. So it means that any, on any complex, you know, if, you, if the tangent space of your manifold has got this almost complex structure on it, it becomes a complex vector bundle. And this taming condition 
means that omega is positive in all the complex lines. And um, he sh gave a theory of J holomorphic curves, which are maps from, well, I, I usually, t with some Riemann surface into the manifold, which satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equation. And uh, it, it, Gromov developed a theory of these curves, and then he used these curves um, to get obstructions to this kind of embedding. So what he noticed was that if you have a, a round ball and you take the um, standard J equal J naught, I mean, our ball is just in Euclidean space, so we can, we can think of it being sitting inside CN with its standard complex structure. And you look at a J holomorphic curve which goes through the center, properly, um, a properly embedded J holomorphic curve through the center. That's a minimal surface with respect to the standard metric, because there's a metric associated here. We have J, G0, VW is omega V, J0, W. Um, so it, it, this is a minimal surface, and therefore its area, the area of this, of this J holomorphic curve, let's call it C, through the properly embedded in this ball through there, is at least A. I mean, the, the smallest area would be the flat disk, and it has to be at least that. So any J holomorphic curve through the center of the ball, can, you, you can use that to measure the size of A. And then he said, OK, suppose we have this big ball, and we put it in a cylinder. And this cylinder is, a, is an open cylinder like this, right? It's a, it's, an, oh, it's a disk times that. But we can compactify it and take S2 of size A times R2M minus 2. And then, so you've got this, this embedding. And so you've got this, here you've got the push forward of J0. We've got the standard complex structure here. And you just extend it. So you take a J on here, which is tame, and which on the image of the ball is the standard thing. And then he proved that this is an arbitrary tame J. He proved there are always lots of holomorphic curves for an arbitrary tame J. So in particular, if you take the center, this is the the center of the ball, you look at its image, which might be there. There's a J holomorphic curve in the class of S2 times point. There's a J holomorphic curve in that class which goes through this point there, goes through the center. And um, now, the area of this um, is going to be of this, the, this has got to have symplectic area big A because it's in this class and it's a homological thing. It's just the form evaluated on this class. So you know this has got size A. So now you take this curve, you, you pull it back here, and you get some curve through the center here. So this is psi pullback of that curve C. Well, the area of this is at least little a. So that tells you that this area, of course, is only part of that. So that tells you that little a is bigger than, is smaller than big A. That's the, that's the proof of the non-squeezing theorem. You get the obstruction because the target has lots of curves in it. And uh, sorry, the domain has lots of uh, property about the curves. It's a fat domain, so the curves have to have a certain area. And the target has lots of curves in it. So typically, you get embedding obstructions because the target has lots of from curves in the, in the target, which have to have positive symplectic area. OK. So that's his non-squeezing theorem. And of course, there was a lot of work done in the 90s trying to extend this theorem and trying to find obstructions to other embedding problems. I mean, this is a ball into a cylinder. Well, you, you don't have to take a ball. You could take a polydisc, a polydisc, say, PA1. Perhaps I'll go on this board. Um, you have a polydisc would be something like PA1 through AN, which would just be the product of lots of two-dimensional balls, where you can arrange the size like that. And then another um, shape that people like to use is an ellipsoid, which would look like EA1 through AN. And that would be. Um, the set of points satisfying the sum of pi z i squared over a uh, i is less than or equal to 1. 
So this is an ellipsoid, and again, you'd order, order it like that. So this is an ellipsoid where the area, say, of the smallest, that's got area A1, and this one has got area A2, and so on. And this, by the way, is the general form of an ellipsoid in, in, in um, Euclidean space. So if you take any quadratic equation and look at an ellipsoid like that, um, it, in the right coordinates, you can diagonalize it and make it look like this. So this is a completely general ellipsoid. And then you can ask, well, when, when does one polydisc embed in a ball? When does, a, when does a, an ellip one ellipsoid embed in another? So, you know, when does E A1 to AN embed in E B1 to BN? And of course, when n is 1, there's absolutely nothing to say, because you're just in two dimensions, and it's just an area question. Um, we, know that, we know that a1 has to be less than or equal to b1, um, because a ball of size a1 embeds in here, and, therefore it's, and this embeds in a cylinder of size b1. Um, but in general, this question, we don't know. So the answer is known in four dimensions, and it's completely unknown. Well, not completely unknown, but it's unknown for n bigger than 2. And sort of this is what I want to talk about today. This other question about when poly a polydisc embeds into a ball or something is just too difficult. We don't know. Um, the sum answers about, even in four dimensions, the sum answers about when a polydisc embeds into a ball, but the function, it, you, we really don't know. I mean, the, the way we try and understand these is you, you take, for example, for the ellipsoid problem, you, you know, you, if you look at when does E1A, say, embed symplectically in a ball, Suppose we just take the easiest version of this problem, and you ask, when does this ellipsoid embed in, in this ball in four dimensions? Then um, one way of codifying the answer would be to define this function C of A. I'm going to define it as C0 of A, which is the infimum of the mu such that this embedding exists. And um, so that's a perfectly well-defined function that you can try and calculate. And for any of these questions, I mean, there's a, there's a, this is for the ellipsoid, you could define an absolutely identical function for the polydisc. Now, we know what this function looks like for the ellipsoid. We have no idea what it looks like for the polydisc, except for small values of A. It's completely unknown. And um, again, you could ask, you could define many similar functions in higher dimensions, but they're all basically unknown. Um, what I want to explain to you today is, for one thing, since we do know the answer, so, you know, more generally, we can ask when does E1, A1, A2 to AN embed in E, B1 to BN? And we know, we know the answer if N is 2. And the thing about the answer is, in n equals 2, is it's surprisingly complicated. You'd think that this was a sort of moderately interesting problem, and the answer would be moderately interesting. But in fact, I think the answer is, is really has a lot of interesting new number theory in it. And the abstraction comes to these embeddings. In dimension 2 especially, we understand the abstraction comes from the existence of certain curves. And we know a lot about curves in uh, two-dimensional, you know, these are two-dimensional curves in four dimensions. And so we really know a lot about this. Um, as I said, but I say, in, 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 when n is bigger than two, we don't even have the answer. So if I tell you the answer to that question, in two dimensions, you can define um, a set of numbers n a1, n a2, a which is just a set of integer multiples of a1 and a2 with l and m, you just take the positive integer multiples of, of, of um, a1 and a2, and, and you take all these numbers and you arrange in increasing, in increasing order with multiplicities. 
Um, and then the answer is that E, E, A1, A2 embeds in E, B1, B2, if and only if this set of numbers is um, less than or equal to the set of numbers for B1, B2, which where this means that uh, the case number here is less than the case number here. So you could write this is less than that for all k. And that's, a, that's not only, it's a necessary and sufficient condition. So there are sort of two sides to this. One is to understand the set of numbers, which is, pr these numbers are probably best understood as what are now called ECH capacities. So there are certain measures of the size of orbits and embedded contact homology. So there's a homology theory that captures all these numbers. So these are the ECH capacities. Um, so that's a theory due to Hutchins. And then, um, and Taubes. And then, um, so that's sort of why there are obstructions, because you have these numbers coming that have to be positive because of certain homological reasons. But then you have to actually, if, they, if this is less than that, you have to have a construction argument that constructs an embedding. And that construction argument is only works in four dimensions. So, so there's, you know, there's no similar construction argument in higher dimensions. And of course, ECH, if you, I'll say a little bit about it, it's embedded contact homology. So what you're doing are counting embedded curves. That doesn't make sense in any, any higher dimension than four because you know, you've got a two-dimensional object. In high dimensions, it's generically embedded. So that's not a condition. But in four dimensions, to say it's embedded is a condition. So that gives you something special. So um, this, again, this is a, a something that was conjectured by Hofer. And again, it looks fairly innocuous. But the, the thing is that this set of, you know, if you, if you translate this condition into what this function looks like, um, the function really looks rather surprising. I, I apologize to those of you who, who know all this, because I've certainly lectured on this before. But if I tell you what this function C0 of A looks like, um, then um, Um, we have one thing we can definitely say is we're looking at when embedding E one A embeds into the ball. Well, the ball of course, the ball of size mu, which is is the same as E mu mu. Well, if this is meant to be a symplectic embedding, then suddenly the volume on this side has to be less than the volume on that side. But the volume on this side is A, and the volume on this side is is um, mu squared. So you definitely know that mu has to be bigger than or equal to the square root of a. So this is the, this is a, a, a lower bound coming from volume constraint, and so um, this is one, two, three, and we have it goes through three, it goes through two, and we have the volume constraint sort of looking like this. So whatever we get, it's above that. And then what the actual function looks like? Well. When A is in between 1 and 2, um, the best you can do is just embed this linearly into a ball of size A. There's nothing, this is, this is a sort of fat ellipsoid. You know, it, it's, it's pretty round and fat. So this is of size 1, and this is of size less than 2. So you can't bend it at all. The best you can do is just put it in a ball of size A. So that means that this function looks, you know, it goes up straight up linearly. But then the question was, what happens after that? And what happens after that is, in fact, that it's constant over that interval. So that was a bit of a surprise. But you can, what it means is that at 4, if you take E14, E14 is completely malle malleable. If this is 1 and this is 4, there's no constraint on embedding that. Perhaps I should put in the interior. You, can, you can't embed the boundary, but you can embed the interior into so then, then the question is, what does this function look like? Well, at 8 and 136, at that point, all the constraints disappear, and you just get the square root line. So that means that if you take a long, thin, skinny, skinny enough, then the thing is very malleable, completely flexible. And the surprise really is that if you look at 
tau to the fourth, where that's one plus root five over two to the fourth power. So the golden ratio to the fourth power. At that point, there's a sort of break in the behavior. So before that point, there's this staircase which goes up. Um, it sort of goes up like this. You see, that line goes through the origin. This line goes slope with it. And you, this one line goes through the origin. You have this staircase going up through the origin and then flat for a while. And it's an infinite staircase, which I can't draw, where the numerics come from the Fibonacci numbers. So the, the numerics from the Fibonacci numbers. And then at that point, so there's an infinite number of steps there. And that's why, because the Fibonacci numbers are related to the golden ratio, that's why you get that in. And then after that, there is a finite number of other steps. So you've got a step at what, a 7, you've got a step at 7 and a, well, I can't remember exactly. But there's a finite number of other steps. So there's a step, and then there's an interval where there's no constraint, and then there's another step and an interval where there's no constraint. So there's a sort of transition period here where sometimes you have a restriction and sometimes you don't. And as I say, all these restrictions, it's always a, it's flat, these things. All these restrictions come from the existence of certain curves. So the fact that you get this very rigid behavior here comes because there are certain curves um, that obstruct the embedding. And there are different ways of seeing these curves. Now, the way I like to see them is um, coming, uh, you know, coming from the geometry of the projective plane. Um, so, Um, if you take CP2, um, so we can, we can always take the ball and the, the, the four ball. And then if you, if you collapse it, if you look at the boundary of the four ball, it's a three sphere with, and, and the symplectic form has a null direction, which gives you the hot flow. So you can, you can collapse the boundary to S2, and that is exactly CP2 with its standard for Beanie Studi 4. So that's the way we think of, of, of uh, projective space. We just think of it as an open disk where you've added a line at infinity, which is exactly the three sphere, uh, the boundary here collapsed out by the hot flow. So w we have that there. And then um, it, so perhaps I should explain what these points are. These points are, these, these points, there's an obstruction at each of these points. And the obstructions come at point A, which is the Fibonacci number um, 2k plus 5 divided by the Fibonacci number 2k plus 1. So they're four apart. Um, and, and the value of the function c at a is equal to um, the Fibonacci number. It's the ratio f 2k plus 5 divided by f 2k plus 3. So it, it, the Fibonacci numbers, you know, are 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 20. 134 and so on. And the numbers we're talking about, they're all odd. So it's, it's this one, this one, this one, and, and so on, right? I won't bother to write them out. But that's telling you, for example, at the point if C were 34 over 5, if, if A were that, C would equal 35, 4 over over 13, right? So we have these completely numeric conditions coming from the Fibonacci numbers. And what I'm saying is that associated to these odd Fibonacci numbers, there happen to be curves in the projective space. Well, it's projective space blown up lots of times. So we take CP2 and we blow it up lots of times. And um, then, um, 
so we've got, we've got generators for the homology. That's the line. And then we have all these exceptional divisors. Um, so you know what happens when you blow up. You take a point in a space, and then you replace that point by all the complex lines through that point. So a point goes to a CP1, but, it, it, but the normal bundle, it, it's, it's a CP1 with normal bundle, the negative, uh, C1 is minus 1. So it's, it's an exceptional sphere. So here's your two-sphere, and you've got some bundle over it. But the self-intersection number of this curve is minus 1. And it's a rigid object for gromov witten theory. So you can, you can make these holomorphic, because it's a symplectic thing, so this will be a holomorphic curve. And um, it, it, the, it always has to exist. So if you deform J, you can choose a J just locally so that it's holomorphic. But whatever J you choose, it's, it has to be represented this class. And for a generic J, if you blow up lots of times, all these exceptional divisors would be disjoint. So you just get a lot, of, a lot of these curves sitting in there. So now, what happens with these Fibonacci numbers is, um, suppose we take, let me just do an example. Suppose we take 34 over 5, which is one of these ratios. And you try and find its continued fraction expansion. So the nice way of doing that is to take 34 here and 5 here, and then mark off squares of length 5. So actually, I need to. Do this, five, 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 five. Six lots of five. And then that's 30. So you've got four left. And so you have one square of four. And then you have four ones there. This is what I call its weight expansion. I don't know what people who do this kind of number theory actually call it. But anyway, that's its weight expansion. And the continued fraction expansion as a, from the multiplicity, 6, 1, 4. So what that means is that this number is 6 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 4, which you can check, um, because this is 6 plus. This is, this is 5 fourths, but if you take the reciprocal 4 fifths, which is 35 over 4. So this is a completely general way of getting the, getting the continued fraction expansion of any number. And so it means that you know, each of these numbers, each of these ratios, has a continued fraction thing associated with it. So what Felix and I discovered is that they also have a, an exceptional curve associated with it. If we take the class 13L, where 13 is this intermediate Fibonacci number, it's this one, this one that comes here the middle one. And then we, rem we take the class where you use these numbers as, um, as coefficients for the continued fraction expansion. So you have 5 of e E1. Um, well, I write it E1 to E6, which is just a short form to say this is E1 plus E2 plus E6. So you have six curves here, each of size 5. And then we have um, one of size four, and we have four of size one, nine, 10, 11, right? So that's, you've blown up 11 times altogether. You get this class. The claim is that this class, E prime, E, say, is the class of an exceptional divisor. So there is an exceptional divisor in that class. You can check it. E squared is minus one. You can check that C1 is one, and then there's another check you need to do. You need to know it, because you, you, you need to show it somehow represented by a sphere. Anyway, you can prove that all these classes are represented by spheres. Now, the point is, as I say, these are incredibly rigid objects as far as symplectic, as far as, um, symplectic geometry goes. So you might well ask, how is that at all related to embedding the ellipse? Well, you see. Um, you, take your, you take a little ellipse of the size you're interested in. So this is E1. We're doing 34 over 5. And we, we, take a, we take a little one, lambda times that, little ellipse we've embedded. And when we've got it embedded in, a big, in, in our ball into CP2. And then you, um, you blow up lots of times inside here. And it so happens that when you blow up, you, well, Symplectic blowing up, you know, I explained it 
um, algebraic geometry, you just take a point and you replace it by all the lines in the point. But if you're doing it symplectically, what you do is you take a round ball. And this is something I discovered a long time ago um, and really made me just why I was always interested in blowing up, because I've always liked Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. And here we are. We take a ball, and you remove the ball, and you collapse the boundary by means of the Hopf map. That gets you a, an exceptional curve, as I was saying, because an, the exceptional divisor, this is S3, the boundary of the ball, modded out by the, uh, by the uh, action of S1. And the point is that if you do that, if you remove the interior of a ball and then collapse the boundary, you have a symplectic form on what's left, which you have to slightly smooth near the boundary to make it smooth, because, you, you have to, because it's, this is not quite a smooth map. But anyway, the point is that that's what symplectic blowing up is, that, you, that if you want to blow, if you've got a ball in a, in a manifold, and suppose this has got size A, you know, the, the, then that means that when you, when you look at the form you get here, omega prime on the blow up, that this, this exceptional divisor you have here will have, the integral will be A. Um, so that's what blowing up with weight A is. It means it corresponds to embedding balls. So when I say we have a symplectic form in, in this class, um, I mean that I've blown up six balls with size five, I've blown up this ball with size four, and I've blown up four balls with size one. And so you embed those in. And then, of course, we've got 13L. Well, um, that means you've got a big line. You've got plenty of room to put it in. Anyway, um, we, we, it turns out why this is relevant to, embedding, to the embedding of ellipsoids is that, in fact, when you, the, you can arrange all these balls in the size of the ellipsoid to cut out the whole, essentially the whole of the interior of the ellipsoid. So the ellipsoid doesn't have any volume left at all. But it, we don't need to worry about that. You just blow it up lots of, lots of times. So the, and then what you do is you look at CP2 minus the, the ellipsoid, and then you complete it at the negative end. So that means that you add, uh, that means you take CP2 minus the ellipsoid, um, and then you add to it the boundary of the ellipsoid times, say, 0 minus infinity, and you put on some sy symplectic form so it sort of looks like a, a conical n going to minus infinity. So that you have, your manifold looks like, here's CP2 with its line in it, Right here. You've got CP2 with a line in it, and then it's got this sort of negative end there. Now, you, you can imagine, we, we start off, here's our CP2 blown up lots of times. In here, we have a representative of this class E. So we have some curve in here. And then we stretch the neck. And you, so in other words, you sort of change J. You change J um, to make the neck, which is the, you know, this, the area of the neck. You make this longer and longer. This is a very familiar process in, um, it's a very familiar process in, in this kind of four-dimensional geometry, stretching the neck. So this curve E, which you have, which I don't know what, I can't draw it. It goes through here 13 times. It goes down here, complicated curve. You stretch the neck, it persists. And it has to have a limit when, it, when the thing breaks up. So it has to have a limit sitting inside here. And what does it limit look like? Well, of course, it intersects this line 13 times. And then the boundary is, is an, you know, the boundary of an ellipse. And it's got finite energy. So you use work of Helmut Hofer that tells you what it looks like. Because it's got finite energy, this curve, when it goes down towards the ellipse, at the bottom, it has to wind around. There are, well, we, we, this ellipse was E1, um, 34 over 5, but you just add a little epsilon to make this an irrational number. So it means that the ellipse that you have actually has only two closed periodic orbits on it. And this curve, in order to have finite energy, near the boundary has to, has to sort of wrap around. It could have several ends, but the, the, each end has to wrap around one of these orbits some number of times. So you get some, you know, you get a curve which has some cylindrical ends, nearly cylindrical ends, which uh, uh, attach there. Now, this curve 
has to have um, positive energy. So that, that is a, an obstruction, so that gives you, it tells you how big the ellipse can be, because this has got to have positive energy. The other thing is you can sort of analyze, well, what's its energy? Well, it's got 13 times whatever that line is, and then you have to figure out what happens at the bottom of it to figure out how much, because the energy is 13 times the size of the line, minus the size of these, you know, the, the action of these things, which will be, you know, however many, if it goes around the short orbit, say, k times, and the other orbit, the, the longer orbit, l times, and this is the ellipsoid e lambda e 1a, say, then the energy of this one is lambda, so the, the energy at the bottom is going to be k lambda times k plus l a. So that's, that's how much energy it sort of takes up. So you get, you get that 13L, or whatever our top thing, minus this has to be positive. So that's, a, that's an obstruction. And so what you work out is that these curves, what they do at the bottom, for these particular values, they have to, they actually have just one end, and it has to wrap around this exactly 34 times. That's what happens. So that, proving what, that's what happens, involves knowing a lot about, you know, it, it involves a theory of embedded contact homology. Um, for one thing, this curve has got to have positive index, so you've got the non-negative index, so you've got some index calculations. It's got to have non-negative ECH index, which is a much finer invariant. Um, you see, we're starting off, these exceptional divisors are embedded curves. The ECH index is a very fine invariant taking account the number of double points and the genus and everything. And anyway, you can use the numerics of that to show that it just has to wind around this exactly 34 times. So we get these curves. And that's where the obstruction comes from. Because you see, this curve has to have positive, you know, however we embed it, we get that, um, so this tells us that 13 times the size of the line, which I'm taking to be mu, minus, and then there's a, lambda is a, well, suppose I, I'm taking lambda to be 1, so I'm trying to embed E1a into B4 mu, so I'm, I'm saying lambda is 1. So we get 34 times the energy of the bottom, well, I said k was 34, and L was 0, so I get that this has to be positive, which tells you that mu has to be bigger than 34 over 13 which is exactly the, the numerics I gave you. So this is where the obstructions come from. The obstructions come from this rather miraculous fact that given these, um, given these Fibonacci numbers, which are odd placed Fibonacci numbers exactly four apart, if you look at the, you know, the, middle, uh, the middle thing there and take that for the degree of the curve and you take the weight expansion of that, you always get a minus one curve. That gives you these obstructions. Now, that's a sort of miraculous happening. Um, and that, you know, there's no other... There are certain other cases, I mean, uh, 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 Christopher Gardner and various other people have been trying to figure out what other embedding problems give you infinite staircases like this. And he seems to have found, so, you know, he's embedding ellipsoids into, instead of a ball, but some other shape, like a polydisc. You know, if you take a, embed it into a square polydisc, you also get a Fibonacci stair, but if you embed it into a polydisc of some other shape, you know, a longer one, then perhaps you don't see such fine structure. But in principle, we can solve these problems in four dimensions. The question is what happens in higher dimensions, because there we don't have a guess. We don't know what the answer is in higher dimensions. You see, in four dimensions, we have this nice set of numbers which turn out, of course, these are exactly the actions of the orbits that appear in embedded contact homology. And this somehow characterizes the problem in four dimensions. In high dimensions, embedded contact homology doesn't exist. We don't have such a fine invariant. We have, we have ordinary contact homology, which is a much weaker invariant and really doesn't tell you very much. And, um, you know, you could make a... Uh, 
conjecture, you know, the, the, the obvious conjecture would be to say, okay, this is what's true in, um, in four dimensions. What about looking at the similar set of numbers, NA1, A2, A3, and ask if that's less than or equal to N, B1, B2, B3. Does that happen if and only if the, um, you know, the first ellipsoid embeds in the second? That's a perfectly good um, question. Um, it just happens that we know the answer to this, that, that, that this is not correct. This is not correct. And in fact, there are embeddings. Um, in fact, this implication is wrong. So there certainly are embeddings that we know about, we can construct in four dimensions that contradict this. And, and then the point is that we don't have any other good guesses. We don't, we don't know what the answer is. We have some examples showing, I mean, the, the first example of this kind is due to Guss. And in fact, it was his proving this, giving some interesting embeddings that sort of made me think about the problem of embedding ellipsoids again, and all this work came out of that. Um, because he had some very nice embeddings. That, um, but we, we, we just don't know what the answer is here. Um, now, but we do know something. So I, I wanted to talk about the stabilized embedding problem because that we actually have some answers for. So that's a sort of easier version of the problem where you you take a, a four-dimensional, I mean, I'm just again going to look at ellipsoids, but you could certainly deal with any, you know, another shape there. You could take, you take this and you multiply by your Euclidean space and you ask when that embeds into a ball, say. So you just stabilize, the stabilization here means that you just multiply by Euclidean space. So one of the things this means is that the volume invariant goes away. So there's no volume invariant. Actually, one of the things I should say, just for completeness, is that one of the things that Gauss's embedding here tells you, you see, if you're looking at this problem, you have a volume embedding. So the volume of A1 is, is equal to A1, A2, A3, and that's got to be less than B1, B2, B3 clearly, because these are finite regions. And we also know that A1 has to be less than B1 by the non-squeezing theorem. And then it was a question of Helmholtz as to whether you could somehow detect the second one. So is there a function f of A1, A2, such that the existence of an embedding implies that f A1, A2 is less than f B1, B2. So in other words, is there an intermediate capacity that somehow measures in the four, four dimensions? Because we're, you know, symplectic geometries are two-dimensional geometries. You have two dimensions and top dimensions, but is there something immediate, intermediate? And Gust's embedding, um, so does there exist? That's a question, and the answer to that question is no. There are no intermediate capacities. So the only thing we know is we, we have these inequalities, and of course, in higher dimensions, you have the volume with it. We multiply by n. But th those are the only sort of obvious capacities you can say. Um, and here, if we look at this problem, we've clearly got rid of the volume invariant. But you could ask, when does this embed in here? And actually, we have some answers. So the first answer, so there, one thing is to do by um, Christopher Gardner and Hind um, showed that the Fibonacci stairs stabilize. So in other words, if we define um, CK of A to be the infimum of mu such that E1A cross R2 K embeds in B4 mu cross R2K. Um, he, he, they showed that CK of A is actually equal to C0 of A for A less than tor to, tor, um, tor to the fourth. So that structure with these stairs 
that all stabilizes and that persists. And that's because the invariants that we're using to find them, these curves, which are curves which, of some degree, with one negative end, the genus zero curves, with one negative end on the, on, on, the ellip on the short orbit of the ellipsoid. Um, these are very stable objects you can show. So you can show that, for one thing, because they've just got one negative end and they're genus zero and stuff, when you put them in, you, mu in, you just product this space we're looking at by R, R2, and the Fredholm index doesn't change. So they don't disappear for index reasons. And then you show, because they just for various geometric reasons that when you, you know, once you've got them in four dimensions, they're regular there, and they persist, so they, and they can't break apart. So you always have curves like that, which tells you then that the invariants are always there. So these are very stable things. So that tells you sort of up to tau to the fourth, we have exactly the same thing. But then there's another beautiful positive answer, um, construction by Hind, that tells you that if k is bigger than zero, so we're definitely in the stabilized problem, ck of a is always less than or equal to, to 3a over a plus 1. So you just construct embedding. So you do the process that, that Francois Lalonde and I worked out in the 90s, which is called symplectic folding. So that's a very explicit, in, very simple an explicit embedding construction, and it takes a bit of room. So you certainly, it doesn't work if you, don't, if you don't stabilize. But if you stabilize, you can very cleverly just construct embeddings so that you can see that that's true. Now, unfortunately, I raced the Fibonacci stairs, but oh, that all seems to be fixed. If you um, look at the Fibonacci stairs, which sort of look like this, um, sorry. They started at one. They went up to two, and then they went along, and then they went along there, and they went along, and they had infinite to there. And then we, uh, so in four dimensions, we had the square root function. But all the peaks of the Fibonacci stairs, all these numbers, all these points, actually, and, tor, uh, and this is tor to the fourth, tor squared, all these actually lie on this curve, 3a. The graph of 3a over 1 plus a goes through all those points, and it goes through there, and then it becomes less. This is 3a over 1 plus a. So what he's got, I mean, what Hein did was construct embeddings which sort of, um, which lie um, below this line explicitly, and they lie below this line when, tau is bigger than, when a is bigger than tau to the fourth. And so um, the con conjecture is that CK of A is actually equal to 3A over A plus 1 for A bigger than tau to the fourth. So that, that's the conjecture. You see, th this part of the thing tells you that you know what it is when A is less than tau to the fourth. And the conjecture is that when A is bigger than tau to the fourth, it's exactly given by this. And um, what we know at the moment is that this is true, we know it's true for some specific values, for a of the form 3k plus 1, 3k minus 1, where k is an integer. And we know it's true for a, well, with, together with Christopher and Gardner and Hind, we worked very hard and show, showed it, it's true for the, some of the even Fibonacci ratios. I think those ones. So this, these are called the ghost stairs because they don't, but they're sort of an infinite sequence of points starting here and going down. It starts at eight and goes down. So we have this, now I, when I was preparing this lecture yesterday, I had an idea which would actually might prove it for all A. Um, we, you see, in order to prove this, we have to construct good curves that are going to give us obstructions. That's the point. And there, we have to work in four dimensions. We have, to, we have, a, we have a nice stabilization theorem, um, so we, which I was sort of mentioning over here, that um, if we have, 
I don't have much time, but if we have a curve in four dimensions like this, which is genus zero, has one negative end on uh, going around lots of times on here, and there's some mild, mild numerical condition. It's meant to have Fredholm index zero and a mild numerical condition. Any curve like that stabilizes, so that if, if, it, if it's there in dimension four, it's going to be there and create an obstruction in all dimensions. So all, in order to prove this thing, for every value of A, or for a dense set of values of A bigger than tau to the fourth, you just have to find a suitable curve. And the question is how you construct these curves. You can construct them by gluing. You can, the way this was proved was by sort of gluing together curves using what's called obstruction bundle gluing. So that's a rather delicate gluing operation developed by Hutchins and Taubes, which tells you that you, know, you have a, you have a, a gluing, a non-regular gluing situation, but they managed to show that in these situations the gluing coefficient was positive so that you can actually get some curves out. So, um, and then for, for these ones, the construction method uh, for these ones, the construction method was much more like I sketched for the other Fibonacci numbers. In other words, you construct this, uh, you construct a curve in four dimensions, which is not quite an embedded curve, but something close to an embedded minus one curve. And then you stretch the neck and pull things apart and show it has to be, have the right properties. Um, well, what I was thinking of, we could take these curves, the curves that we have for these, which are very nice curves with one negative, you know, they have, they have one negative end on this ellipsoid going around 3k minus one times, and we could stretch the neck along some intermediate ellipsoid. So there's some neck stretching argument that might allow us to get enough curves to prove this, um, to prove this conjecture. And if we could prove this conjecture, that would at least mean we had a clean answer to this problem, which would be very nice. There are lots of other unknown questions, but that would be solve this one. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Yeah. Is it, is it a simple construction to embed a long skinny ellipsoid? The only uh, construction is the volume? No, that construction is not terribly explicit. Um, the way you do it is to embed a small ellipsoid, and then you use a you distort the symplectic form and outside the ellipsoid. You somehow, well, for one thing, you, um, you know, an ellipsoid, I described blowing up a ball, right? So you cut out the ball and then you collapse the boundary and you get a nice two sphere. Well, if you, if you embed an ellipsoid and you take a rational ellipsoid, you know, E, P, Q or something, um, one P over Q, then you can cut out the ellipsoid and then collapse the boundary, but you get an orb about orbit fault points, right? You have a sort of toric model. You have a model where the singularity there, it sort of looks like that. Well, you can resolve that singularity and, and replace, if you could find a, a set of curves here, a singular set of curves, which if you could find in your manifold, you can sort of cut them out and put the ellipsoid back in. So you can sort of blow down along them. So instead of looking for ellipsoids in your manifold, you look for this singular set of curves. And, and actually, what I, you know, the, that weight expansion stuff, if you do the Fulton resolution in the toric geometry of this and this, sort of it's a simultaneous resolution, you get the minus continued fractions. But the minus continued fractions at that end and that end are related to the plus continued fraction. For, so you exactly, you know, it's all related to, to sort of resolving these singularities and things. Um, but anyway, you get this ellipsoid. You get your model of the ellipsoid, which is a singular curve. And then what you want to do is to find curves in the ambient manifold which say intersect this and don't intersect here. And then if you find curves you can, you can in, with, which um, have non-negative self-intersection, J-holomorphic curves, you can distort the symplectic form here by adding a large multiple of the Poincaré, um, of the, of the Poincaré dual of this class. And, and because of you sort of the symplectic neighborhood theorem, you'll get a family of symplectic forms, which when you renormalize, will tend to make this very big, as big as it can be. And these, are, these will remain tiny. So what you do is you distort the symplectic form outside the ellipsoid, so it fills as much of the volume. You can, I mean, and the claim is that you can fill all the volume, essentially, up to, 
and then there's some argument that if for every epsilon you can fill up to epsilon amount of the volume, then, then you can actually embed the whole of the interior. But it's very non-constructive. Um, Heinz's argument is, is constructive. And people have found some constructive arguments, but not, I don't think, for, for you know, if you have A bigger than 9 and you're trying to embed the thing in, I don't think people have found explicit construction. Uh, well, um, Helmut likes them because he says, you know, he's interested in dynamical systems and that's sort of the simplest non-trivial dynamical system because it's simple harmonic motion. Um, um, is a torus. Well, you know, this picture of it is a sort of the toric, local toric model of it. I mean, the thing is, it's got a very nice shape. You could, I mean, it's a perfectly good question what's simple about ellipsoids. One thing is they're much easier to deal with. I mean, you could also have a family of polydisks, which are these products of disks. But, you know, to try and deal with a product of disk and embedding something like that, you know, when does this product of disks embed, we just don't know. I mean, you can define the same function, no reason to have ellipsoids. I mean, you could say, why ellipsoids? Because we can give you the answer. That might be a, uh, you know, there, there just aren't such good invariants for polydisks. And, and the thing about a polydisc is if you sort of look on the corner here, you have a torus. And, and, and so, you know, people try to relate embedding the polydisc to things about this, this Lagrangian torus on the boundary. It's a sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you've got a disc times a disc. You take the boundary circle of one times the boundary circle of the other. That's Lagrangian. Can you relate that? Um, I mean, there are a lot of symplectic embedding questions. This is one of the few that we can actually solve. So that's 